institutional Seventh-day Adventist presses haven't addressed last-generation theology for about 20 years. But suddenly, in 2018, last year, several new books uh, came off the press. And um, so we had um, God's Character in the Last Generation with, I think, 12 seminary professors. And then we have George Knight, End Time Events in the Last Generation, the Explosive 1950s. And um, we have Salvation. I think this was 19 uh, authors from the seminary. And uh, Soteriology, the Study of Salvation. And this one came out last year. And then, in all humility, saying no to last generation theology, theology was another uh, volume that came out. Suddenly, uh, after 20 years of, of basically nothing, suddenly four books at one time. Total, totally a coincidence, I, I guess. Trees were manufactured into paper so that these uh, books would exist. And so time is only going to give us a brief opportunity here to share from really from one of the books. And so we're going to spend most of our uh, time we do have here uh, addressing this book, God's Character in the Last Generation, which is a pretty familiar title after yesterday, yesterday evening until now. Uh, now, along with uh, George Knight's book, this, this book, have been, these two books have been distributed all across the North American division. Uh, they've been given to uh, many of the pastors in many of the conferences. Uh, I haven't been able to confirm that it's been given to every single of the 59 conferences in North America, but it's gone to many of our workers. And so, uh, we have a widespread uh, stirring that's come from this. So now, the issues set forth in God's character in the last generation, they fall into two categories. This we what we call disagreements and uh, misrepresentations. Now, before we consider that book, though, I think we need to double-check something. Uh, are we wearing a pair of glasses that we don't even know we have on? So our pastors and church school teachers go through denominational schools. They're assigned what's called required reading uh, about Adventist history. And for decades, the church's understanding of Adventist history has been especially shaped by the writings of George Knight and Woodrow Whidden. In fact, I have a couple of their many volumes here. This is from 1888 to Apostasy. Uh, this is George Knight's uh, book about the, the life experience of A.T. Jones. And then we have, by the way, I'm not recommending all these books, just you'll know the difference. Uh, this book is uh, Woodrow Whitten, and uh, the title of this one, this is another biography. This is the From Physician of Good News to Agent of Division. This is the biography of E.J. Wagner. And so those are a couple of books, just samples out of the many uh, books that Woodrow Whitten and also George Knight have written. Now the years from 1957 to the publication of Questions on Doctrine, uh, from that time to the 1980 dismissal of Desmond Ford, set up a changed theological landscape. Characteristic Adventist views about Jesus, obedience, overcoming, the close of probation, and the sealing didn't fit well in this new atmosphere, and it was within this milieu that what I would call the night widden narrative, uh, the night widden narrative arose. The night widden narrative provided an updated salvation understanding that was more evangelically defined. Teachings by key figures, including, as you saw, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, uh, M.L. Andreessen, and even Ellen White, those figures, their teachings and writings became the subject of updated, shall we say, explanations. Long years of book releases, articles, classroom representations, and speaking events made the, the KWN, the Knight Widen, uh, narrative, they made that the institutional self-understanding of the church. Now, George Knight's book, In Time Events in the Last Generation, you know, my wife was right, I brought too many books. <laughs> um, George Knight's book here introduces uh, two lists, and what I want to do is uh, just go down these lists that George Knight has provided. On page 79 of this book, 
he has a list, and he lists certain names in sort of a sequence. And so those names are in order. Um, Herbert Douglas, Colin Standish, Russell Standish, uh, Dennis Preby, and then, and then my name, Larry Kirkpatrick. So that's one list of uh, persons that are called the, the, um, the Andreasen supporters. Then George Knight has another list in his book on pages 82 to 86. He goes through and he calls these people the reactors. These are people who've popularized, uh, persons who've popularized a different view uh, theologically. And his list of the reactors you see there on the screen, according again to uh, George Knight's list, uh, Edward Happenstall, Desmond Ford, Morris Venden, Hans Le, Kayla Rondell, uh, George Knight, and Woodrow Whitten. So I didn't really name these people, uh, George Knight did. Now Knight sees the inclusion of Desmond Ford in, in actually a positive, a very positive way. He actually says this in the book that I was just showing you. Uh, what, so here's the quotation from page 84. One area where Ford and Happenstall found common ground was soteriology. That's the doctrine of salvation. Here Ford has often been misunderstood, according to Knight, but he did the denomination a service by highlighting the fact that righteousness by faith in the New Testament is restricted to what Paul calls justification by faith and did not include sanctification. That's what George Knight tells us. Now I want you to understand the significance of, of these things that we're, we're hearing from these books. Knight places his and Ford's salvation theology in contrast with the church's previously established theology. We shouldn't miss that. Knight, the Knight wit and narrative writers have, and with some success, they have recast Jones and Wagner and Emil Andreessen uh, as villains, more or less. And so that's, that's a kind of a challenge for us. Now it's true, these people, uh, Jones and Wagner, did uh, depart in many respects from, they, they, they failed after they were treated poorly and they still have their own, you know, their own responsibility for their failure. But still, what we really want in history is an honest history. We don't want a, a spin history. We want to be really careful with our facts and what we say about those facts. So, um, so where are my, there they are. More books. So what I have here is, um, I've created a little downloadable resource uh, that anybody who wants to can download. And we didn't, this is not one of the handouts. We have a handout we'll get to in a couple of minutes. But there is a resource here, and this is my website, uh, greatcontroversy.org. Began in 1997 and has been up and down a couple times, but uh, it's been running for at least a year now since it had, was down last. But greatcontroversy.org is my website, and all these resources will be available there for you. If you see the pane on the left side, and you go down to, uh, there's an email list you can subscribe to, but if you go down to where it says resources, if you're watching this online, uh, or you want to get this resource I'm telling you about, uh, you can go there where it says resources, and at the top, the very topmost one is the one we put, I put up the other day, which is for this seminar, this symposium. And there's something called the, uh, some initial uh, some initial, it's called the Knight Widden, I don't remember what I called it here. Some initial resources correcting the Knight Widden narrative. And it's just a, a list of uh, four pages of, of footnotes from these books. This is uh, Ron Duffield, Return of the Latter Rain, Volume 1. And this is a really wonderful history book that helps us understand and gives us another slant on history. And um, there are a lot of footnotes here. This goes through the period... Uh, working way up into 1888. And then this is another one by Ron Duffield. And uh, this is called Wounded in the House of His Friends. And the resource that I'm mentioning to you uh, is just a list of footnotes uh, from their books that you can look at yourself where they document some misrepresentations or representations that are made by uh, Knight and Whitten and some others that are, um, shall we say, problematic sometimes and sometimes worse than problematic. Now, uh, Ron Duffield doesn't know I was going to mention these, so he has total deniability. <laughs> but those, I, I'd recommend those books to anybody who has an interest in following this up and checking for themselves. So, not saying that everything that uh, Knight and Whitten have said is probably wrong. I'm not saying that at all. I'm only saying that when it comes to certain areas of Adventist history, 
there's a certain slant or there's a certain uh, uh, viewpoint that's been expressed, and it has become the established viewpoint, really, among, um, among North American Adventists. And there are some, some really uh, substantial problems in several places with that. So you can look at that and study it for yourself if you'd like. Well, let's go on to our, our books, um, our wonderful book here. So by the way, uh, a lot of the authors in this book, I know them and I don't have anything against them. These are a lot of good people. Not When I say the things I'm going to say here, passing on into our actual looking at the book a little bit, none of it, I hope, comes across as mean-spirited in any, in any way. I think these are good people. I like them all to be my neighbors, both here on earth and in the new, king, the new earth. Um, but there are some times when we have to look at the same material and disagree uh, because these are matters that are really important. I mean, it comes down to what is our identity as a people. So let's talk a little bit then about, the, um, about, that, about that book. I want to, first of all, give you three general observations about God's character in the last generation of the book. So first of all, this is a book of opinions. And so uh, what you're going to see here, and we won't read them all, but you're going to see um, there in their slides that there's a lot of opinions represented in this book. Here's just a few of them. It seems then that humans would not be able to perfectly overcome. It tends to place the emphasis on human works and suggests this. It's, it appears this way. It, it suggests this. This could be. Uh, it makes it seem. It could have been. And the page numbers are all there if you want to look at them. It tends to imply, page 37. Uh, such an argument insinuates this, uh, page 114, all the way through the book. This book, God's Character in the Last Generation, is uh, very largely a book of opinions. And that's one thing to, to understand as we begin to look at the book. Secondly, I'd like to uh, point out that the book is filled with mischaracterizations, synthetic blob statements, and straw men. For example, uh, God's character and the last generation presents the following, and I call it a blob statement. This is, um, this is a, ter a, a, a few slides we'll look at here that gives you kind of a summary viewpoint of supposedly what last generation theology is. So uh, let's see what this blob statement says. Some Adventists affirm what has come to be known as last generation theology, LGT. And it goes on to say, we might minimally define it as the view that there must be a last generation of humans who become absolutely sinless and perfect in order to provide the grounds to vindicate God's character and win the great controversy. In this regard, generally speaking, LGT affirms that an additional phase of atonement is necessary beyond the ministry of Christ in order to finally defeat Satan. Specifically, there must be a final, entirely sinless generation of humans that, by completely overcoming sin, provides the grounds for the vindication of God's character, playing a crucial role in deciding the victor in the great controversy. In this view, then, Satan was not defeated at the cross, some group of humans must become perfectly sinless in order for Satan to be defeated. That's page 17 of that book. Almost every part of the statement is a misrepresentation. No one on the planet holds such a belief as that statement word for word the way it was given. It's a false representation and you, know, you put one up and you can take it down very easily. And um, there's no reason for there to be a false statement like that because those of us who have addressed this kind of a theme have done it, I think, with, usually with some care. Another example of an unfair representation in God's character in the last generation is, uh, is, is this statement. This is page 104 and 105. So here's what, uh, here's what the blue book says. God's character in the last generation. The sacrifice of Jesus is said to be of sufficient value to save me, but it is not said to be of complete sufficiency and merit. In subtle ways, LGT affirms the insufficiency of Christ's sacrifice and the added value of one's obedience to the experience of salvation. Such obedience is unmistakably meritorious. Well, when I read that, I was interested because he was quoting from my book, or at least he was talking about my book. 
cleanse and close, last generation theology in 14 points. So if you'll indulge me just one moment, I'm going to read what I actually wrote, page 65 and 66, from my book. So here's what I actually said. We cannot possibly keep the commandments of God without the regenerating grace of Christ. Do we realize how ready he is to empower, to recreate? He is seeking us, desiring to make us conduits for faith. He does not save us by law, neither will he save us in disobedience to law. Neither faith nor obedience saves, but neither does salvation come without the obedience of faith. Without the faith that obeys, authentic Christianity is impossible. And then down the page just a bit further, I said this, all the merit toward my salvation comes through Jesus. His merit is valuable enough to save but that is only the objective portion of a two-part plan. My obedience is also necessary. Now listen, in itself, it is insufficient to save me. It is a non-meritorious condition, a necessary but insufficient condition. So we're not saved by our obedience, and it's not meritorious. And in my book, I said it's not meritorious. But in the other book, they said I said it was meritorious. So I guess you can decide which, what do you think. So anyway, that's uh, another example uh, from that book. Now, if you go down the third item here, just these are just three general points about the book God's Character in the Last Generation. Most of God's Character in the Last Generation doesn't even refer to authentic statements by the named contemporary LGT authors it attacks. So if you look at the book... There's 936 footnotes. So I went through the footnotes. Nine of the 14 chapters do not refer in any place to these, these LGT source documents that I spoke about. Nine of the chapters there's, uh, don't even refer to it. And then in the, in the chapter notes, half of the chapter notes cite George Knight or Woodrow Whitten more often than they cite the LGT source documents. Half the footnotes, in, or rather half the chapters. So those are three general observations. It's a book of opinions. It has blob statements that sort of characterize us as teaching thus and so when we don't. And then uh, finally, it, it doesn't really use the main source documents the way it probably should. So those are three general things. Now, um, let's talk about some specifics. And here, I think there's been a handout that you've all received. It's just a little helper handout. I've taken the many charges here and condense them really into six. There's more, but anyway, we can look at these six um, as we look at this. So if you look at the handout, and um, we'll, we'll have a, a link here. Yeah, you have the handout on the screen, and those of you that might be watching uh, this again at a future time or if somebody who's watching it online, you'll see a link in a minute uh, from my website where you can get the, uh, the handout. You can download the PDF if you wish. In fact, we can put that up right now. So I'd like to go through this and just tell you quickly about this, this little handout. Uh, there's four columns. The first column categorizes the charge. The second column in bold gives the God's character in the last generation. It gives their basic complaint, what they're saying about what our teaching is. The third column uh, presents short quotations and references from the book. And it also shows, interestingly, similar claims from books by George Knight. Uh, because all the things pretty much that you'll find in this book have uh, virtually all been said by him many, many times over for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, just kind of repeated, we're kind of repeating those things over and over. So, uh, and then in the last column, the fourth column, uh, you'll see uh, a little bit more accurate representation maybe of what we do believe with, with references. So anyway, let's look now at each of these charges. So I'd like to go to the first of the six charges I want to address uh, here, and I want to look at the question uh, about it being dependent on humans. So here's, what, uh, here's the charge that LGT makes, the charge is that LGT makes God dependent on humans. So years ago, in a search for identity, one of George Knight's book, he wrote this. Andreasen's final generation theology, he said, makes God dependent upon human beings, namely the Adventist church, for his justification and final triumph. That's page 152. Um, and God's character in the last generation, the blue and white book, also, as it does with most, most of Knight's other charges, it repeats this claim. Here's what it says on page 17 of, uh, of the book, the 2018 book. LGT makes God's victory in the great controversy dependent 
upon the fidelity of mere creatures, thus requiring the view that divine revelation and action are insufficient to win the great controversy, but must be supplemented by human action, unquote. Now, this book wants readers to think that the biblical teachings like a fallen nature Jesus, victory over sin, and justification that includes regeneration and action, that uh, this book wants us to think that those, those things are, are problematic, that they're human-centered. And in the end, God's character in the last generation recycles Knight's disagreement. So you find it there just again, in case you missed it the first 18 times he talked about it. So what's the question, though? What is this question? Is, um, can an infinite being, an infinite being, can an infinite being even be dependent on humans? And I think that's a pretty good question to raise. That is an interesting question. God is faithful to humans because of his self-obligation. We heard it today in Titus 1 verse 2 in Sabbath school, God cannot lie. We see it in 2 Timothy 2 verse 13. If we are faithless, says the Bible, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. We see it in James chapter 1. He, and he is the father of lights and there's no shadow of darkness or turning in him at all. God is true always. And so he cannot lie. God has authority to limit his own course of action. It's, it is an expression of his divine sovereignty. He is omnipotent, but there are things that he could do which he wills not to do. He has freedom to obligate himself to man. And across the history of his people, he very frequently does. Have you read Genesis lately? Did, uh, did Abraham have something that God owed him? God went out of his way to obligate himself to Abraham. And God, throughout the Bible, comes to, to people and he makes an obligation. He's the one that came up with the covenant. He's the one that comes with the gospel opportunity. Jesus died on the cross for us. We didn't die on the cross for him. God is making a way and he is inviting us to participate. And so, God shows voluntarily uh, to do this for us. He is holy, he is selfless, and therefore he is unalterably opposed to sin and self-serving. He sets the conditions within which he operates. When after Jesus' death on Calvary, Satan brought forth new charges, and that's Desire of Ages 762 and 763, when he brought those charges, God chose voluntarily to address them. Here's some of those charges. Uh, by his life and death, Christ, Christ um, he said that God's justice does not destroy his mercy, but that sin could be forgiven and that the law is righteous and can be perfectly obeyed. Satan's charges uh, were refuted. God had given man unmistakable evidence of his love. But you know, it goes on to say that now this was to be, uh, now new deceptions were brought forward. And there's a whole list of new charges that Satan introduced into the mix. And so God chose voluntarily that he would address these new charges. He didn't have to. He didn't have to for you. He didn't have to for me. He certainly was not obligated to Satan to do it. But God in his sovereignty decided that he would address these charges. And so that is the way that God is. He could have left Satan's claims unanswered, but he chose to engage in a demonstration of the validity and fairness of his law and of the availability and efficacy of his power to enable believers to overcome. Didn't have to, but said, I'm going to do it. And in his wisdom, I'm sure he knows that it's a good thing to do. Long ago, God exercised his divine sovereignty when he asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. He exercises his divine sovereignty again at the end of time when he declares, Here are this the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are Bible, clear Bible cases where God is making a demonstration. Job was a demonstration of God's grace at work in one man. It was God's sovereign idea. Jesus was a demonstration of God's grace in a man who was God. It was God's sovereign idea. The final generation will be a demonstration of God's grace at work in an entire church family of believers. And you know what? It's God's sovereign idea. God chooses to impose upon himself 
a condition to be met before Jesus' return. He has chosen to demonstrate that his law can be kept by a group who live fully for Jesus. And the result is found in Great Controversy, page 665. As the redeemed have beheld the power and malignity of Satan, they have seen as never before that no power but that of Christ could have made them conquerors. In all that shining throng, there are none to ascribe salvation to themselves as if they had prevailed by their own power and goodness. Nothing is said of what they have done or suffered, but the burden of every song, the keynote of every anthem is salvation to our God and unto the Lamb. That is the feeling that they will have on that beautiful day when they see the face of Jesus. Friends, God provides the atonement. Non-divine humans do not provide the atonement. The movement for human salvation doesn't come from man, it comes from God. In Signs of the Times, April 22, 1903, Ellen White wrote this, All that we have was entrusted to us in order to fulfill his mediatorial plan. So notice, his mediatorial plan, not ours, his. God has a mediatorial plan. Now listen, we were brought into existence because we were needed. Wow. How sad the thought that if we stand on the wrong side in the ranks of the enemy, we are lost to the design of our creation. You and I, we were brought into, the, into existence because, according to the inspired writing, because we were needed. The infinite God who doesn't need anything, brought us into existence to show forth his power and his mercy and his selflessness. And it was his design that you would exist and that through your life, his goodness would, would pass into the universe expressed. And so this idea that, well, last generation theology is very human-centered, it's a bad thing. I guess we can think about that some more, but I would take into account the fact that the fact that we were brought into existence because we were needed. And maybe Satan wanted to destroy every possible mirror that could give glory to God and reflect his beauty, the beauty and holiness back into the universe. God imposes upon himself the task of securing a universe in which beings are given free choice. It's not our business to tell God how to win the war, just as it was not Job's business to tell God how to win the war. Our business is to do what our master sends us to do and let him win the war. Well, let's move to another issue. And in the book, it's called, uh, Can the Fallen Human Condition Be Transcended? But pardon me for being a little bit old-fashioned. I'm going to throw away that theological uh, terminology, and I'm going to say, Can man experience victory over sin? Okay? We'll address it that way. So the second issue is, can man experience victory over sin? So the issue under this heading is really very simple. No matter how you speak of it, uh, we're talking about the question of original sin. And this has many headings and many, many phrases have been sprung upon the church to try to explain this. Um, original corruption, uh, the, the, the fallen human condition, and so on and so on. But we're talking about really effectively original sin. God's character in the last generation puts it this way, quote, Adam's first sin was voluntary, but after this, he and his descendants possess a corrupt nature, and therefore we both, we sin both voluntarily, and I agree with that, we sin both voluntarily and involuntarily. And it goes on to say, sin is a lack of conformity to the will of God, either in act or state, into which we are born. And then it calls it original corruption. Now, the Bible is clear. We fallen humans are called to transcend our situation in this present age in the power of Jesus. The sin issue is central. Matthew 121, Jesus came to save his people from their sins. Christianity without victory over sin is not even a New Testament religion. 
And yet the closing pages of God's char character in the last generation hopelessly intone, quote, as has been seen in the previous chapters of this book, if sin is more than actions, including an infection of our very being and character, the free will of humans is severely constrained by this enslaving alien force of sin. Now, these are different ways of saying you really can't overcome. You're stuck. Man, you are stuck and that is it. God's character in the last generation, the author of that, this chapter, chooses not to mention the Bible content which contradicts his idea. For example, Romans chapter 6 verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? And Paul's response is, certainly not. Certainly not. God forbid. In the God's character in the last generation chapter addressing the question of, of what sin is, important scriptures are drawn from Romans chapter 5, verses, 15, verses 16, 18, and 19. Now, Paul does link our sinning to Adam's sinning there in that place. He does. But he never says that, the, that guilt is involuntarily transmitted. There's a connection between Adam's sin and ours. Paul tells us that Adam's sin introduced weakness, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, Romans 8, verse 3 but also that Christ's victory makes divine strength available so that the Christian is not obliged to follow previously established habit patterns of sinning. Romans 8, same chapter, uh, same book rather, Romans 8, verse 12 and 13. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That is a point uh, pointing to victory for us. Now, there is a sense in which Adam's sin initiates what we could say a, a, a series of chain reactions. He starts the chain reactions. But the sins that follow Adam's sin, just as Adam's was, they are individually chosen. If, if Adam hadn't sinned, we wouldn't have inherited weakness. Because of his sin, his descendants inherit a human nature modified for the worse, and we've all got it. Ellen White gets it, though. In Education, page 29, she writes, The result of the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is manifest in every man's experience. There is in his nature a bent to evil, a force which, unaided, he cannot resist. To withstand this force, to attain that ideal which in his inmost soul he accepts as alone worthy, he can find help in but one power. That power is Christ. And then she says, cooperation with that power is man's greatest need. There is in each of us a bent to evil, which apart from God's help, we cannot resist. Every human experience is a self-serving, self-destructive inclination. Inevitably, unless we are cooperating with God, we succumb to this force through our own intentional, willful, premeditated choices. Without divine intervention, we would destroy ourselves. Don't leave humans around nuclear weapons. Don't leave humans around unguarded cookies. It's, it's just not good. And so each person is born with weaknesses and tendencies to evil. Each person becomes morally accountable and sins, and by a voluntary decision, they enter the path of rebellion. We've all entered the path of rebellion. But we are gifted with that most godlike of attributes, free choice. Free choice. Oh, so much depends on the free choice. The Holy Spirit stands ready to empower every believer and to make Jesus' victory effective in the life. Jesus' victory over sin is available to you through the Holy Spirit. And so Ellen White can write this in God's Amazing Grace, page 193. Read it well. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is what? Made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome most hereditary and cultivated. I misspoke, forgive me. As a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress whose character on his church? His own character, to impress it on his church. How does God make righteous those who are in him? Well, Jesus lived victoriously in humanity like ours, but that doesn't automatically save us. We still determine whether we will give our allegiance to self or to God. 
And so Steps to Christ says this, page 58. If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him, and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, to breathe his spirit, and to do his will. This is an actual change. Humans cannot be forced to sin. We must first consent. Christ indwelling us is Christ indwelling us is actually righteous, and so his righteousness becomes our righteousness. When we choose self, we choose to reproduce in ourselves the same kind of sin as the first Adam. All sin is actual. When we choose Christ, we are without strength to do right, but we invite him into our heart, and he indwells us. His presence brings an actual righteousness. We can never stand apart from his actual righteousness. All righteousness is actual. We don't have any righteousness we can call our own. We always need Jesus. We will never come to a time when we don't need him. God's character in the last generation mentions Ellen White's statement from Child Guidance, page 475. Quote, as related to the first Adam, men receive from him nothing but guilt in the sentence of death. But any who pause long enough to read the entire passage will see that she is commenting on the challenges of parenting and she assures readers that through wise Christian parenting, quote, Satan's power is broken, unquote, and the child can become, quote, a partaker of the divine nature, unquote. Read it for yourself. Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 236. Friends, the Bible promises us victory over, over sin. That's a promise to the believer. And really what the main dividing line is, is in, in last generation theology, victory over sin is possible. In the revised gospel, it's not. Let's move on to number, the next one. Justification, more than forensic. Another dispute is over justification. God's character in the last generation author's argument alleges that justification is strictly forensic, that it's, it's counted only. His views hardly differ from the changed form of Lutheranism that followed Luther's death. In the God's character in the last generation, uh, in his book, in, in his chapter in the book, his theology is Lutheran all the way through. And he uses these Lutheran phrases about simulustus uh, yet peccator. God is at, uh, people are at the same time just and a sinner. He talks about Christ's alien righteousness, a alien righteousness, coram deo, how we are in the, in the eyes of God, and so on. He even claims that the idea in justification that God works inside the believer, he says that's Roman Catholic. But a study of the early Adventist teachings and the writings of Ellen White finds little correspondence with God's character in the last generation, with his theology. Ellen White's most positive statements about Luther uh, deal with the events of the 1520s, not the time between 15, uh, coming out into the 1580 when you get the formula of Concord. The author, after quoting Ellen White's corrupt channel statement, which we'll look at in my talk later this afternoon, uh, he claims that our sanctification always falls short of the glory of God, page 84. He quotes his favorite Ellen White statement summarizing the essence of justification by faith. Here's what he quotes. If, this is Steps to Christ, page 62. If you give yourself to, yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you were accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character and you were accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. And that is beautiful and true all the way. But that's where he stops quoting. The quotation continues in the very next paragraph, the very next word. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and do according to his good pleasure. Amen, Amen to that. Now, in Ellen White's view, Christ changes the heart. And there's more than being accounted righteous. The author failed to include this continuation in his main text. And so I wish he had put it in there. Here's another selective use of Ellen White. He says, The danger has been presented to me again and again of entertaining as a people false ideas of justification by faith. I have been shown for years that Satan would work in a special manner to confuse the mind of, on this point. Faith and Works, page 18. Now, a key point in Ellen White's Faith and Works chapter, in faith, the book Faith and Works, is this utter impossibility of our meriting any salvation because of our own works. And we agree. We agree with that. But she also makes clear that God's plan for us is no mere forensic declaration. Listen, page 27, same book. The soul temple is to be sacred, holy, pure, undefiled. There must be a co-partnership in which all the powers of God and all the glory be belongs to God. She goes on to say, the law of the human and the, and the divine action makes the receiver a laborer together with God. It brings man where he can, united with divinity, work the works of God. Humanity touches humanity. Divine power and the human agency combined will be a complete success for Christ's righteousness accomplishes everything. And that goes with the other statement. 
Christ's righteousness accomplishes everything. Cooperating together with God doesn't mean that our works merit us salvation, but White says, quote, in order for there to be an outflowing, there must be an income of divinity to humanity. Faith and Works, page 26. That's transformation language, and I'm very thankful for it. That's why I want to be a Christian. I want God to change me. Now, he goes on in the chapter, and he... Um, he quotes Alistair McGrath's summary of the magisterial viewpoint on justification on page 60 and 61. And he gives a nice quotation there from Alistair McGrath. What's interesting is that he quotes Alistair McGrath as, a, as an authority, and he is an authority about the topic of justification, but he doesn't quote some other things by the same fellow. His book, Justitia De, uh, Alistair McGrath's book, also says this when he's talking about the same place in his book, page 209. Alistair McGrath says, the most accurate description of the doctrines of justification associated with the Reformed and Lutheran churches from 1530 onwards is that they represent a radically new interpretation of the Pauline concept of imputed righteousness set within an Augustinian soteriological framework. In other words, McGrath is saying there's something new that happened there. And you've got to differentiate between Luther, the Luther years, and then the Melanchthon and onward years because things shift there a little bit. McGrath goes on and he constant, candidly states this, page 213 in his book. He says, I am aware that neither Martin Luther nor Aldrich Zwingli can be said to have understood justification in precisely this manner. See, we want to find out what Luther taught about justification, not necessarily what the ones that came right after him taught. He goes on to say, this is again Alistair McGrath, Luther does not make the distinction between justification and sanctification associated with later Protestantism. Luther doesn't make that distinction. Page 227. And McGrath finally points this out. The essential distinguishing feature of the Reformation doctrines of justification is that a deliberate and systematic distinction is made between justification and regeneration. That is, for the first millennium and a half of Christianity, justification was understood as including regeneration. Not until after Luther's active years, and he, he kind of gets into some health issues and, and becomes less active, not until after that is justification commonly referred to in the forensic, legally accounted sense. Sanctification beca becoming something very separate. Not until the period from Melanchthon to Chemnitz does the teaching become common that regeneration is something separate, human, and forever incomplete. And so I wish that he had not only quoted this person as an authority on Lutheranism, with the thing you did quote, but maybe he could have brought up some of these other conclusions by the same person, which are good, correct conclusions. Um, by the way, original sin, uh, you have a book, uh, I think we'll have a slide of this here. The book of Concord is, um, is got all this Lutheran theology in it, and you couldn't quite see it, but in the next slide, the, uh, at the very first thing on the list there on the left side, the very number one is original sin. So... These things all kind of fit together in one piece. Well, let's move on rapidly. We have to go on to other items. So what about the charge in the book, God's character in the last generation, that humans must attain absolute, that we teach that humans must attain absolute perfection. Absolute perfection. Pretty good goal, right? So uh, according to them, we teach that we must believe, uh, achieve absolute perfection in order to be saved uh, and pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps because and then we'll no longer need Christ. Here's how, here's how our, our book says this. Um, Last generation theology advoc advocates perfectionism, which maintains that humans can become absolutely sinless. This tends to place the emphasis on human works and suggests that one might reach a point prior to the glorific to glorification when one is perfectly sanctified and thus in no longer in need of the imputed righteousness of Christ, if they must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor, does that mean that they must have fully overcome sin in all respects prior to glorification and in a way that they no longer need the work of Christ in their behalf? By the way, I found this the most, the most offensive item in the whole book, to think that, that some of us are teaching that we come to a place where we don't need Jesus, that out, George Knight had the same allegation years before. Here's what he wrote in Search for Identity, page 151. In actuality, according to his, he's talking about M.L. Andreasen, his theology, humans must get to the place where they don't need Christ, where they can stand without a mediator on the basis of their own achievements. We don't teach that. We've not taught that. Knight repeats his charge verbatim in, uh, in the book we have here. The new books lather, rinse, and repeat. But none of us have taught 
that we must attain to absolute perfection ever. We agree that without Christ, we are hopelessly lost. We can never reach down inside of ourselves for righteousness. We can never in eternity come to a place where we no longer need Christ. More than we need air to breathe, we need Christ for spiritual life. So what about these phrases, these phrases in these books of a new order that they put into our mouths? Phrases like absolute perfection, sinless perfection, absolute sinlessness, perfectly sinless. Uh, What about those phrases? I don't use them. Dennis Preeby doesn't use them. Herbert Douglas didn't use them. M. L. Andreessen didn't use them. A. T. Jones didn't use them. E. J. Wagner didn't use them. Ellen G. White didn't use them. Nor did anybody in the Bible use them. And yet these phrases supposedly represent last generation theology viewpoint. Such phrases occur 69 times in God's character and uh, the last generation and 18 times in the end time events the George Knight one, which is a much skinnier book. Otherwise, it'd be there more, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) In fact, I can only think of one individual on our side of the question who even uses these kind of phrases, this kind of phraseology. Is it fair to tar a whole group on the basis of one individual using ill-advised terminology? Is that fair? Well, let's move on because there's a lot more in the book and we're really just But let's go on to the question about Jesus. Is Jesus, as the book claims, is Jesus just like us? Just like us. According to the authors of the material found in these two books, according to them, those who believe in last generation theology insist that, and I quote, we can be absolutely sinless even as Jesus was absolutely sinless In order for Christ to be our example, it is argued he must have been, and then it's italicized, he must have been just like us. If he did not, he is not fully human like us. God's character in the last generation, page 18. Now, the only problem with this is, again, that it is not a fair or accurate representation of what LGT teaches. None of us teach, without qualification, that Jesus is just like us. There are many respects in which Jesus is not just like us. Would you like to see a few? For example, Jesus is not just like us in that he is God, eternal, and pre-existed his experience as a human being. He never sinned. His character is sufficient in value to redeem all of humanity by his life of meritorious obedience. He condemned sin in human flesh. He is equal to the Father. He is one person of a three-person self-existent being. All things are placed in subjection to him. He tastes death for every human. Jesus alone is the great high priest. He has authority to lay down and take up his own life. He alone has authority to forgive sin. These are ways that Jesus is not like us. And there's nothing new. There's nothing new here that we just figured this out. Jesus is like us, though, in these respects. These are not everything, but these are samples. He is like us. He took our infirmities. He bore our sicknesses. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men. He was tempted in all points like as we are. He is able to die. He took on him the seed of Abraham, an inferior to angelic nature. His experience in our humanity gives us an example of victory. His mind, thoughts, and attitudes can be echoed in our humanity. You know, Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so Ellen White, Ellen White writes in Selected Messages, book 1, page 247, Christ did not make believe take human nature. He did verily take it. He did in reality possess human nature. As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And she also said this in Christ Triumphant, page 208, Christ's perfect humanity is the same that we may have through connection with Christ. Christ took our nature, fallen but not corrupted, and would not be corrupted unless he received the words of Satan in the place of the words of God. Those are pretty insightful items, I hope, I hope you're noticing from the pen of Ellen White. Yes, we who believe in Adventism, or in other words, last generation theology, I think they're interchangeable. We who believe in Adventism do point to our understanding based on the Bible and that's supported by Ellen White that Jesus' human nature is like our own. Jesus was made like his brethren. 
Ellen White, there's so many Ellen White quotes, two of them. Temperance 107, the Savior took upon himself the infirmities of humanity and lived a sinless life that men might have no fear that because of the weakness of human nature, they could not overcome. That's why Jesus did it. She goes on to say, Christ came to make us partakers of the divine nature and his life declares that humanity combined with divinity does not commit sin. Our future, another quotation from Signs of the Times, October 14, 1897. Our future eternal happiness depends upon having our humanity with all its capabilities and powers brought into obedience to God, placed under the control of divinity. Many have no real faith in Christ. They say it was easy for Christ to obey the will of the Father, for he was divine. But God's word declares he was tempted in all points like as we are. And we could go on. Uh, the last segment is, have we delayed the second coming? This is the weakest material in this book. Uh, it's very weak. Um, doesn't address any of the key quotations, really, uh, from Ellen White's pen. Um, doesn't address the main texts. You know, we need to make a distinction between personal salvation and God's character vindication demonstrated by God's people. It's one thing to be saved. It's another thing to be used by God to vindicate his character. And those are two, we need to keep those two items distinct. I'll read just one of these um, and then we'll come to our conclusion. Uh, here we have Desire of Ages 633, all right? Desire of Ages 633. By giving the gospel to the world, it is in our power to hasten our Lord's return. We are not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of the day of God. Second Peter 3.12. Then she says this, Had the church of Christ done her appointed work as the, Lord, as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned, and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. When was the Desire of Ages written? 1898. Before then, second coming, 1898, would have come. None of these Ellen White statements were even mentioned in the chapter in God's character in the last generation. So that chapter was kind of a problematic. Well, let's go to our conclusion. Where do we land? Where do we really land with all this? Half of the charges against last generation theology are relatively straightforward disagreements. You know, you say this about what justification is, we say this. You say this about what sin is, we say this. Uh, half of them are like that. But a lot of them, the, the remaining three that I've picked out here, are straw man representations. You know, it's like a, a scarecrow. You set it up and then you, you, you can wipe it out real easy. And those are things that really are problematic. When we, what then about these books that we've spoken of today? What about these books that, that our ministers are being reading and thinking about? What do we do with a book like that? You know, a few years ago we were here and we talked, I talked a little bit about questions on doctrine. Questions on doctrine has some real giant problems. I'll tell you what though, questions on doctrine has some redeeming features. Questions on Doctrine has some good historical material. The chapter in, in Questions on Doctrine on Michael the Archangel is very good. There's some, it's, there's some very bad things there, but there's some very good things in the mixture. QOD has some redeeming features. It, it, this book gives us no particular help where we have straightforward disagreements about teachings, and it's worse than useless because of its decided misrepresentations. Um, this book. Actually, yeah, the, 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 this book pretty much goes in the same spot. So, <laughs> so uh, for someone who really wants to understand last generation theology, uh, the, two, the 2018 books are really a needless waste of trees. Uh, I like trees. I lived in northern Idaho for five years and uh, love the trees, and I feel sad that a book would be turned into, a tree would be turned into a book like this. But um, I don't think that people, I hope they weren't mean-spirited when, when they created this. I think they meant well, but they just didn't represent it fairly. Okay, so let's have care for them. Uh, and to our presses, I guess I would say this. It could just be me, but very few of my church members are clamoring to buy books filled with 10-2s, seem-2s, it could be's, and it might be's and repeating the George Knight thoughts about 1888. Could just be me. Now, those who do wish to understand last generation theology, what would you do if you want to understand it? Start by immersing yourself in the Bible. Read from the Bible. Read the writings of Ellen G. White. 
You might also read two other sources. M. Allen Dreesen wrote a book in, in 1937 called The Sanctuary Service. And uh, you'll find some really helpful things there about the last generation. Go there to the original source and read it from M. Allen Dreesen. And, uh, and wherever my book went, uh, this one also, you might find it useful, maybe, too. I don't know if there's any of those left, and there might be a few left. Yes? Oh, Dan, Danny Strever has all the rest of the copies left. Uh, all 10,000 are gone almost, but we, we've got a few, I guess. So, uh, let me conclude with this then. Our time has run out. Um, let's critique the, the real sources rather than make up sources and then critique those. Just seems fair to me. The Nightwidden narrative has become the establishment story. Nightwidden, uh, the KWN stands in exact contrast to the authentic Adventist positions. A chasm divides scholars from lay people who read the Bible and Ellen White writings. There are different conceptions of Adventism. Um, these books take matters too far. I hope that we've come to a time when many of our, some of our younger scholars will think for themselves and revisit Knight's representations concerning last generation themes. The way I see it, it's basic Adventism versus the Nightwidden narrative. And so let's be faithful to the message that God has delivered us. Let's finish the work and let's see Jesus. Shall we do that? Amen. Amen.